just uh, chat. Yeah, absolutely. I want to welcome everyone back to the Learning Clinic on CKLU 96.7 FM. I am your host, Bob Kerwin. And um, this afternoon, we are talking education. We're taking a, a break for a week from our Meet the Candidates um, shows. And in the studio today, I have Ryan Cooney, who's Executive Director of the Canadian Youth Golf Alliance. Uh, a lot of people are going to recognize Ryan. Ryan, you 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 spent a lot of time on the golf courses. Uh, I in did. The area. I did indeed. Uh, Lively Golf Course was uh, my first home. Uh, you know, my second home was the Copper Cliff, but my first home from probably the age of fourteen till uh, early twenties was Lively Golf Course. Absolutely. Yeah, I grew up on uh, a house that was right on. I think it's the ninth, ninth fairway, hole. the ninth hole. It was. Uh, yeah, I can remember when Lively was just a bush area, and, and I was there when they actually started it. And, um, Wayne was, my brother was a, a, a CPGA pro there, and built the Sixth Avenue course, and has been involved with golf. So, so yeah, you, you've got a golf background, and people will recognize Brian Cooney. And, and now, it's interesting that you now have... Uh, I, I, it's a it's a not for profit or a charity. Is it it's right? a not for profit. Okay. And the reason I'll just tell you the reason yeah. it's a not for profit and a charity is because we have youth in unemployment programs that work for us. Okay. And the way the charity laws work is you can't be an employee of a charity and benefit from it at the same time. So the youth who are involved in the employment program wouldn't be able to benefit from the education or the golf programs legally. Okay. Yeah. But it's not much difference between them. No, absolutely, proper. absolutely no difference. No. You know, no, you're still you're accessing funds and grants and yeah. what have you. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the Canadian Youth Golf Alliance, because it's, it's not that old. It's, it's re fairly yeah, recent. Yeah, it's a, it's three years, but two years working at it, uh, you know, full time. Okay. So uh, the, the way that it started is obviously golf. It's in our name. Um, we're more than just golf, but um, we definitely are, uh, our, two of our programs are based in golf. So the employment program, we get youth working at golf courses all over Ontario. In Sudbury here, what we do is we have them working at Cedar Green, Timberwolf, Monte Vista, which is the, the old uh, course in the valley, right. uh, at the Idlewild and at Lively, and actually at Pine Grove and Stone Hill this year. Got, so, so we basically have uh, all the golf courses covered for our youth working there and uh, then we obviously have golf programs different golf programs but we needed a way to access the youth and uh, you know hence the school of school of philosophy started to develop when we were going into high schools we recognized that uh, one of the things that was you know missing in school being someone who actually graduated from Laurentian with a, a master's in humanities I noticed that there was a lack of that in school, so uh, we're filling a gap, if you will, in the system and, and, and going in there to teach philosophy of life. <laughs> That's a big curriculum. It is, <laughs> absolutely it is. It's, so, it, 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 yeah, I mean, zero in on that, just, just a little so, bit. So our, our school of philosophy, uh, one of my mentors and good friends for a long time, uh, Anna Barsanti, uh, no, Anna quite well. Yeah, so so Anna and I were chatting when we first began uh, de developing the programs, and one of the things that she said was, "You need to have constant contact with the youth, for the youth to trust you and to develop strong programs where you know they're they're not disconnected for two months or six months or whatever." Right. So. Um, when when I started to go into try and figure out what we were going to do every week with the youth. Uh, it's not every week in Sudbury, but it is in Toronto where I live. Here, I'm, I'm traveling up here, so it's every you know two or three weeks up here. But anyway, the, uh, the things that we were generally talking about were things that matter to them where risk is involved. So problems with relationships, addiction, education, 
um, you know, just, just, just life, right? Just, just issues of life and looking at them philosophically and trying to, trying to get them to engage in what I felt was missing in school, which is when I did my master's here, we sat around just like you and I are now, Bob, and having a conversation. And in school, it seems like the conversation is a one-way conversation. That's just the way the system is. That's nobody's fault. You know, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not blaming the system. Yeah. It's just you got a it, master's through the system, and you. It, it, it is what it is, right? Yeah. As they say. So, so we changed it around, and we created a seminar-style classroom. And what I found was, when I'm sitting at the same level of the students, the students are much more prone to engage in the conversations and see me as a peer rather than a teacher, which I'm not. You know, I'm, I, I. I well, I would not, like I would like to consider not. myself an educator. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but a teacher in the, in the classical sense, uh, I'd probably get kicked out of the schools. I mean, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we can have a long philosophical discussion as to yeah, what is a teacher? And I I, I say you show me any parent and try you know try to tell me that they're not teachers. Yeah, um, you show me anybody who somebody can see doing things and they are teaching. Yeah, te te you know. teaching, teaching something, and, and you're exactly right. Yeah. What I try to do with the students in our classes is throw the teacher hat onto them yeah. so that if I'm not there, these conversations can still happen, whether it be at the calf table or anywhere else, yeah. um, you know. So, so that's really our, our agenda is to create life learners. Yeah. Now, I've spent my entire career as a teacher, <laughs> as a certified teacher, and... And the things that you're talking about are things that I, th I think attract a lot of young people to the profession. Being able to talk and being able to help individuals and being able to help them with their philosophy of life as they're getting the curriculum and developing the skills. And, and you're right, you, you've got a, a master's in humanities and, 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 and when you take a look at what's happening in our system today and, and probably even when we were growing up, is there's a lot of things that are getting in the way of life and get, getting in the way of learning and people tend to cope and get through the system somehow but they don't resolve the problems and, and uh, I know that most people who finally get through the system if they're going to be honest they will say that there were a lot of barriers and challenges that that they had to and nobody can Absolutely. walk out I shouldn't say nobody but very few people can walk out and say they didn't have their moments when uh, they look back and think you know I'm not all that proud of those particular moments right and so I even think, the good students you know, oh yeah even yeah. the good students yeah because it's that's growing up yeah so are you finding when you're talking to these and there's small groups right that you're doing yeah there's there's typically between 8 and 15 so it's a good support group for Conversation. Absolutely. Are they yeah. all the same ages, or they yeah? Okay. Yeah. So it's from the same class, same grade level. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here in Sudbury, it's uh, uh, it, different at every school. We have a different partnership at every school. But some schools, what they'll do is they'll handpick some students, okay. and then other schools will give me a whole class. So I'll work with them. The idea is to work with the same students from September to June, okay. right? So that's kind of the idea. And really, nothing that you're doing with these. Selected groups, the selected students, is anything that what we would call a normal student couldn't use either. Well, no, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I think that as I was going through high school, and I'm not going to lie to you, I had problems with addiction, and I had problems with skipping, and I had problems with the system. I fought the system, I fought the authority of the system, not particular people. And when I started to study philosophy in university, I found a way of studying, not a discipline or, or, or not a topic or, I'm not talking about Plato or Aristotle or anything like that. I'm talking about, you know, just, just a way of, just like science or math, it's just a way of studying. And I was always someone who was philosophical but didn't know it and wasn't able to nurture it. And so, so in today's class, we had a straight-A student who is in grade 12, and she said today that this was, I'm not going to toot my own horn, well, maybe I will. <laughs> she said this was her favorite class because what we do is we find meaning in things like a poem 
where instead of trying to interpret it with certain rules and guidelines that they have to interpret it with, and usually, uh, according to her at least, it was she was never felt like it was her interpretation ever, and she didn't remember studying the poems. Whereas today we brought in, uh, you know, a couple of poems, and I fooled them, and there was really songs, which is poetry in and of, uh, in and of itself, and. She was, she was able to just look at the poem as if it was written for her. Yep. And that's what, uh, as you know, being an educator, that's what text is all about. It's about us taking ownership of it yep. and having a dialogue with the author or yep. with whoever else we want. And that's, you know. Everybody, everybody writes something for their reader. Absolutely. And Margaret Atwood said it perfectly, right? Like she, she has a, a great poem called My Dear Reader. Right? And, and she's not writing it for her, she's writing it for you, and she also gives you the freedom to interpret it however you want. There's no, no wrong interpretation. There's no wrong interpretation as long as you're doing it seriously. Yeah. Right? And these classes are not, uh, we're not going into the classrooms and talking about what you did on the weekend. We're talking about how things impacted you over the weekend. Whether you got in a fight with your friend or someone defriended you on Facebook. Uh, all of those things mean something, yeah. and at the end of the discussion, if you can pull some meaning out of that, maybe you'll find out that it actually means nothing. But if you don't go through the the philosophical process and the dialogue, how are we ever supposed to figure out what education even means? Like, why are they studying? Is it, uh, you know, it, it is it is it the case that if they memorize everything? spew it back out onto a paper that they are star students? Well, the answer for them is right now, yes. And that is, is what you're talking about for everyone, you know, is, is philosophy for everyone. Well, if they can figure out what education means, then absolutely. And it's like, what does work mean? I, I was, I was, that was my next segue. It's, this is something that would uh, benefit uh, a group of employees. In, in, a, in a corporation, in a company. This would be like staff development because when you're talking about interpretation, interpreting, uh, interpreting memos and, and, and problem solving and all of this, it's all a matter of how you're interpreting. And, and a memo coming down from uh, the general manager, for example, uh, unless that general manager knows how the memo is being interpreted by his employees could be offensive. It could be, and and, and often could, it is. Well, yeah, because of the different uh, backgrounds. Well, people, people take have. things personally as well, right? You could yeah. get a memo yeah. and think that the memo was written specifically for you, yeah. right? So people are are now walking on eggshells. Yeah. It 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 shapes, uh, you know, it definitely yeah. shapes who they are. If we're talking about like uh, organizations, we'll go to the PGA, which your brother was a member. Yeah. It still is. He's a yeah. master professional, yeah. one of very few in Canada, and I was a PGA professional for 12 years, and the organizational structure of the PGA is such that it uh, it basically uh, it doesn't allow for the members to have much say. So when the members are trying to shape their own organization, which the membership is much bigger than the few that work in Acton. Right. Uh, there's a disconnect there. It's very tough for them philosophically to understand why the PGA is doing, uh, and the PGA is, is progressing. It's doing some good stuff, but it's very hard for the membership, just like a student, to understand what are you doing. There's no discussion, no dialogue going on. You know, we're, we're, we're you know, at, at least it seems to me the PGA is trying to uh, create a, you know, a stronger membership where they feel more secure and there's not mass exodus every time they make a new policy, yeah. right? Just like in schools when they change curriculum, yeah. there is a mass exodus of a certain group. There always has to be, yeah. right? When it went yeah. from science to math, the mass exodus was philosophy yeah. and, and arts. And unfortunately, when you're looking at the, an exodus from a, a place where you're captured, like yeah. in an employment situation where you, many people just can't, get up and walk out right. and find another job. And, and in schools, you can't. That's when you get into disengagement, which is worse, worse than leaving. 
because when you're disengaged, you basically are becoming indifferent to anything that's happening around you. Well, Remember? that's that's what the, the the young girl was talking about today. Is is she's disengaged from the thinking process. She has figured out the way to memorize, yeah. and she's figured it out well because she has straight A's. But as far as engagement goes, why would she engage? She doesn't get paid anymore, right? Just like a, a worker, wherever they are, if they're, if they're gonna get paid the same amount, they're not gonna work harder. But if they get the meaning yeah. of why they're working, they could step it up a notch, yeah. right? And especially people in my business with charities and uh, you know nonprofits in that sector, if the passion isn't there, uh, and, and it's just basically, and you don't understand why the organization exists, you're just waiting to get your check. Yeah. And, it, and it, it essentially is another job. And I tell all my volunteers when they start working for me, or start doing work for the organization, I should say, that two things are, are gonna happen. Either you're gonna feel 10 times worse than you did before you started working with me because of engagement, or you're gonna dodge me when I start bugging you about not doing the work you promised to do. Yeah. So it's uh, it's an ownership thing, Bob. I think, you yeah. know, like when students step up to the plate and start realizing that it's not Mr. Kerwin that owns my education, I own my education, yeah. things become a lot different, right? That yeah. it's, it, you know. And it tends to happen around grade 11. Yeah. I, I've noticed that with the tutoring and, and stuff that we've done. It's, it tends to happen around because at that point, students start to take ownership because they see that what they do is going to have an effect two years from now when they get into college or university. And, and up until that point, this sense of purpose, uh, for many of them, it's, I'm going to school because. Uh, and, and what do you think the reason is for most of them? Well, I mean... Why, I why, are, why are they there? I. I don't think that they see any personal advantage or personal benefit, even though they will all say that uh, they know that it's not good not to get an education. But when you ask them why, why are you here? Why do you want an education? I've been in classes, uh, for I went around for a year with uh, uh, Everest College. It was CDI at the time, talking about career planning. And I would sometimes start off my class and say, well, none of you are here for an education. So there's not one of you that want that. That wants a piece of paper. Well, and I said, so you want the piece of paper. You're not here to get an education. You don't care about a love of math. You want that paper. Because that paper is needed to get you the interview, to get you into the job that you really are looking forward to getting into. That's why you're getting an education. Nobody wants the education. But you're getting it. And what do you think that, uh, from your experience, I agree with you 100%. If you, if you had the piece of paper that, uh, you know, on their table or on their desk at the start of the class and said, you could take this piece of paper and walk out now, uh, you still got to pay the tuition. Or you can stay in the class and study. I'll give you the piece of paper at the end. I'm sure 95% would take the piece of paper and run, run for the hills. Possibly. However, I've been through one, my master's degree is the first time that I, I really felt that I enjoyed my education. Because in many of the master's courses that I took, the professor would come in and the professor would say, oh, you tell me what you want, you want an A or a B? And if you pick an A, then I'll expect A work you will get an A. And if you pick a B, I'll expect you work. So whatever you feel you want to put into this, you tell me now. And that's the mark you're in. <laughs> and I'll tell you, when you put down an A, you took ownership for that A, you, I, I never worked so hard in my life. Because I knew it was a personal reflection on me. It wasn't someone judging me, it was you me judging it. me. Yeah. And uh, my son, Warren... Self-employed. Uh, yeah, son Warren went to Trent University uh, for his teacher's college. He came here, to, all, all three of my kids came to the commerce program here. Okay. Uh, absolutely never did any one of them think they were ever going to get into teaching because you don't take the commerce program if you think you're going to have to compete with people who are getting 90s to get into the right. teacher's college. Right, right, right. So 
uh, when he did get in, in he got, yeah, he got into Trent. And uh, and at Trent, that's what they did. They said, no, there's no tests, there's no marks. It's past Trent. Success or, or uns unsuccessful. And it's basically, you put into this what you want to get out of it. And, and everybody it's knew. the way the system was forever. Oh. For 2,000 years. It, 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 you know, people learned. Because they knew that what they were getting out of that year was going to help them in the classroom. Not what they're getting out of that year was going to get them the mark that the teacher decided to give them. But it was going to get the, it was going to help them become teachers. So all of a sudden now you took ownership saying, what I'm doing is helping me. I'm not doing it because somebody's going to evaluate me. I'm doing it for myself. And I thought, my goodness, why can't we do that with everything? But we live in this generation that says somebody has to evaluate and tell you what they think your work is worth. And as soon as somebody starts saying your work is, is less than perfect, you have a natural defense. Absolutely. It, 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 and, you, you've, and after you've done this for 13 years <laughs> in school. Plus. Plus. Right. Uh, everybody's telling you how imperfect you are. Yeah. Or, no or how awesome you are when, so, so there's, there was a girl in yeah. another how girl awesome in class. How awesome you are when you're really not. This girl in class today said, I know how to make everyone around me ignore me parents, teachers, and that's just to continue to do what she does and get straight A's, yeah. play on the basketball team, play on the volleyball team, do all the extracurricular stuff, be the perfect student. And she said, only in this class am I allowed to talk about my feelings, what matters to me, what Friday nights are like for me. Yeah. I'm expected to stay in when all my friends are going out. I'm, if I go out, I have to feel guilt and shame because that's not what it, that's not the image that, that I'm putting out there. That's right. But if I don't put this image out there, I'm scared that uh, I won't get the scholarship. I'm scared that I'll stop getting recognized and getting awards and things like that. And then if you think about the progression from that to university to work, it doesn't change, right? So if we, uh, you know, if we pay people based on evaluations in the same way that we grade them, then the self-worth of people can't increase, right? If you make minimum wage, but you feel like you're a really hard worker and you know that you, sh you should be getting 20 bucks an hour or something like that, then the question, the philosophical question is what is my worth is based on that, not what you feel. Yeah, and, and I mean, we tend to judge people based on what people are paying, and so we. Well, that's what that's what it is. That's and, and what, in school, or, or the title. Or the that's title. another way we could do it. When you're yeah. a PGA of Canada professional, like yeah. like I was, I worked at about um, you know at about five to ten thousand dollars less than the poverty line every year. Oh, I, I saw right. right? I mean, yeah, the number of hours you put in. Yeah, yeah. And, and and you know it's Canada, so so we don't have the longest golf seasons. Yeah. So come you know October or something like that, my self worth was off the map. I wasn't even a PGA of Canada professional anymore. Yeah. I was a someone who was trying to find something to do in the winter. Yeah. Um, you know, bartend or whatever. So then my worth shifts. Yeah. It's a confusing self. Yeah. Uh, we, we could never do this, the, even this right here, Bob, yeah. even talking about it right now uh, between you and I is, is, is something that's new for people. It's fresh. Yeah. You know, people don't even know what philosophy is. When I say philosophy, it's a bad word for most people. What is that? That's weird. What do you guys do? Mm -hmm. And when you say, you know, it, it, we talk about issues. Yeah, talk about life. We talk about life. We talk about, yeah. you know, and, uh, and really, you, you, the the place where probably more philosophy is is considered and dealt with is uh, is on the golf course. Oh, <laughs> in between holes. It's, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> absolutely. What do you do with your What do you do with your your mad self? What do you do with your happy self yeah. when you when you make a shot that you didn't make before? Yeah. Does the you know does that most of most of the time? What I find is that when I'm taking out new golfers, and especially youth, 
is that you can see a lot of their uh, their personality traits within the first hole by the end of the first hole. Yeah. Uh, some of them just want to pick up their ball and hide underneath the turtle shell, yeah. right? They don't even want they don't want to continue to try it because we've been trained to do things we're we're good at and to ignore the things we're not. Don't try and get better at them. Don't ask questions why you're not good at them. Yeah. Instead, just ignore that and do what you're good at. Yeah. And sadly, uh, that means that there's good, the, the golf, in golf, there's not a lot of new golfers because everybody's terrible at the start. Yeah. Not many people pick up a golf club and are good at it straight away. No. So what are the odds of them coming back next week to golf if we're not in programs? Yeah. And, and one of the big problems is you're comparing yourself to others. And I think when you get into education, that's where the that's where the problem is. And the, if you're an A student or a B student or a C student, you've been labeled, and that's yep. your identity. It's like if you if I said I'm going to bring in a hockey player from the NHL and uh, he's making five hundred thousand a year, you're going to look and say, oh, he can't be making much, except that he's making an awful lot more than the Prime Minister of Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you're talking about a five hundred thousand dollar year hockey player, he's garbage. He's garbage. Yeah. But five hundred thousand dollars for the prime minister of Canada, nobody would agree to pay him that much. Right. Right. So yeah. it, it, it's so relative when you're comparing. Or someone who's running the highest charity in, yeah. in Canada, right? That's yeah. helping hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of youth, and yeah. no one wants to pay them. Yeah. We talked about a person being a mayor, a mayor, or a city councilor in Sudbury, and you're going to pay him thirty thousand dollars. You're thinking, if if you had a person on a board of directors of a half a billion dollar a year company and you said you were paying them thirty thousand dollars to, to run the company. Uh, Ridiculous. Yeah, it would be there's Ridiculous. no way in the world. Yeah. So so now we get the kids and, and they've got all these conflicting messages. And that's why I said what you're discussing with this group of students is great. The people that are not getting the message at this point are, are the ones that are not in the room and straight-A students have probably more stress on them. Absolutely. And I can tell you, I used to tell, I used to tell some people at the, what I call the, the worst students in the class, I used to say they're probably the most likely to succeed in life if they're one at the bottom end of the class. But they've just learned that it's easier to be successful to be at the bottom than it is to be successful to be at the top. So it takes an awful lot less work to be at the bottom. And if that's where people expect you to be, why try to change? It takes a it takes it takes a life changing for me. It was it really was studying philosophy and realized that uh, I wasn't a bomb. I wasn't stupid. I, all all those things that I told myself, because at the at the time when I was in grade nine, I skip I failed every class and I I went to Llewellyn. I I skipped. I failed. I went from an advanced student. From a French Catholic school in Lively, good student, uh, you know what the system would call a good student, to an awful student, what the system would call an awful student. I was still learning, but I was learning something that wasn't in the classroom. I was learning social skills and, and a bunch of different things. So when they said to me, you're not advanced, you're general. And today it's not, you're not an academic, they don't say unacademic, you're not in yeah, academic, applied or, you're applied. Yeah. So right away, they're making a decision yeah. that you can't study in the ivory tower. Yeah. You can go to the college. You'd probably be good at a trade, Ryan. Yeah. And uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who just doesn't like doing labor, period. I'm just not that type of guy. It doesn't make me happy. Yeah. But I was almost forced into it. Had it not been for golf and people like Wayne and John Hasty saying, Ryan, why don't you, you know, come on board and let's, let's uh, make something happen. Uh, I would probably be doing a, a you know, a, a labor job because I'm, I'm a big guy and people think like, well, you know, Ryan's a strong guy. Let's give him a shovel and let's get going. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it, labeling exercise again, right? What is, what does applied mean versus an academic? Well, it, I'll tell you what, it means a lot to the students. However, they've never had a discussion about what it means until they get into our class and we allow that discussion to happen. Yeah. Because most of them, at a few of the schools, some of them are all applied. So uh, they say, we're not as smart. That's what it means. We're not as smart as that group. So if I go back to my, here's, here's the ironic part of it all. If I go back to my 
uh, my yearbook and I look at all of the students that stayed in applied or stayed in, in uh, advanced and none of them have the same level of education that I do. Uh, most don't, the most that I know, I, I know what they do, I, it's Sudbury, we're still connected in ways. Yeah. And the friends that I have that went into or got put into general credits are all quite successful entrepreneurs, to be honest. Yeah. You know, they, they learned how to do things regardless of the system. Yeah. Right? So there's, 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 something, there's something about in grade nine that really irks me labeling a student yeah. at 14 years old that they're not going to go to university just because they skip. Or whatever the reason may be, and it's uh, it's annoying. I know, and it's and it's one of those things that that, that, that there's a game that has to be played. Uh, the better students learn how to play the game; they know they're going to get out of it. They but they can, they can, they have that sense of control that they that discipline that say, okay, I can play this game. It's not who I am, but I know how to play it. I, I in my in my classes, I taught grade seven and eight for a long time, and. Uh, difficult classes to teach, you know, 13, 14 year olds. I used to Math, tell, oh, challenging. Any, any, anyway. I used to tell the students that, that if they didn't want me to surprise them and ask them a question about homework or about anything that maybe they didn't know the answer to, so as long as they were looking at me, I wouldn't ask them a question. So just they're trying to stare at you. me. Right. Stare at me and I won't ask you a question. As, but, but if you talk to somebody beside you or if you don't pay attention to me, I'm going to ask you a question. So I said, I don't care if you're thinking about what you did last night or what you're going to do tomorrow, as long as you're looking at me. I said, don't pay attention to me and I'm going to ask you immediately. So, yeah, some of them got a little, you know, they, they understood this and I, and I said, why? I said, and, and I'd explain to them afterwards, usually the year after. No, I wouldn't explain to them that year. That you can't help but pay attention to what you're looking at. You can try as much as you want, but if you're going to focus on something, you're going to look at something, you're going to catch what's coming. Something. If you're not looking at it, you're going to be focused someplace else. And so I That's knew smart. that as long as they kept quiet, they were going to listen. They were going to catch more than if I just didn't ask them the question. And the better students were paying attention to anyway. Right. So I, I'd say, unless you put up your hand, I won't ask you a question if you're looking at it. And, and so it, you get into this whole game playing, role playing, and, and, and um, trickery. It, it is. And, yeah. and I, I, used to, I used to, I mean, some of the most rewarding moments of, of my teaching career was, was when I would take a grade seven student or a grade eight student and, I, and I'd sit down with them and I'd say, you know, you're in what we call special ed, you're, you're in resource. Now you're in my class for half the day and you're in resource for the rest of the day. I said, if, if I talk to your parents and they agree, would you mind staying in my class all day without resource help? Uh, it was unbelievable. They, they just, you, you, you thought that you just created a whole new person when you could take that label off them. And they didn't have to be the one in the class that only came back to class for the easy subjects. Right. Now they struggled. They knew they were going to struggle. And, yeah. and, and they knew that, that they were going to have to work hard. But for them to stay with the group all day gave them a whole new identity. And they were so happy that they didn't have to go to special ed. And, and, yeah. and that even even the label special ed. Yeah. Right. You know, I, like it's, there's it's, a lot of derogatory terms that came that yeah. came with that, and, and yeah. you know, special. Yeah. When when somebody says he or she is special. Yeah. Um, you know, it puts it, it definitely puts pressure oh, yeah. not not only on the person but their their peers, the parents. Uh, parents start feeling shame or bad about what they did, and uh, you know, parents uh, are, are obviously they went through the same system. Most of them are not trained to to be able to ask philosophical questions, and you know, it's just a method. It's just a way of doing things. And the problem is that people are scared to face um, their prejudices. Well, yeah. they're, they're scared. They're scared to face. Like with teachers, I sat down with a whole room of teachers and the principal at the school wanted me to go in and have a chat 
with the teachers on my methods of educating. It and was a bit scary at the beginning. <laughs> it, was, it, it, it was because the teachers didn't want to be there. Who the hell is this guy coming in here? He's, you know. Yeah. And, and my first question is, was to them was a very simple one. What do you do? Right? So if someone asks you at a cocktail party, what is it that you do? And, and if you say, I'm a teacher, you know, that's, that's an easy way out. But yeah. what is it that you do? Like you, for you, the, the, the story you just gave me is, I change lives. I shape lives. Yeah. And a teacher, like you said at the start of the segment, is a parent or a coach or, you know, we all have, teach, we, we're all teachers, yeah. right, in one way or another. But to say, I'm a teacher, is pretty, pretty uh, silly. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like it's just silly. Like what, anybody at the table could say. I'm yeah. What, what what is it? What is it that you do? Like in a date. Yeah, what do you do? Right. What do you do? Are you you know? Are, and sadly, uh, you know, a lot of them after the the discussion, we had about a half hour, forty five minute discussion, came up to me and said, you know what, Ryan, I didn't ever think about what I did. No. Right. So so what I did was I did what I was trained to do, yeah. and I became. You know, I'll say it, a minion, right? And I'm just part of the machine and I'm just going through the, the yeah. motions. Discipline, uh, making sure that you create that, that, that higher grade average than you did last year, all of those things that come from the administration, yeah. rather than you're here for the students. Yeah. Not only that, you work for the students. Yeah. So the system is, the students have no input, just like with most organizations, the people who are, you know, in, in the trenches can't come out and say, you know what? Yeah, maybe teaching philosophy will allow the students to see us in a different light, yeah. to see the system in a different light, to see themselves in a different light. Yeah. And until you get to university, and, and only if you choose a class in philosophy will you be exposed to that type of thinking, sadly, yeah. very sadly. And it's, it, you're right, and, and we all need it. And, and it's so, it, it's it's unfortunate because with, with all of the, the different stresses and, the, in life and all of the different things that are happening, I, I, I've often told people, mm -hmm. that, that I, I've sat back sometimes and looked at my 25 or 26 kids in class, and sometimes I, I'll wonder, I wish I could just get inside each one of their heads and find out what's going on in their life now. And then I got to the point of saying, I would not want to know. Right. I couldn't take it. If I knew exactly what was what they were pain. thinking of right pain. now, the pain that they're going through, the pressures at home, the different, it, I would, it, there, there's a, there's a, uh, a video. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, it's, it's called, uh, I think it was a, a, a kid in school called uh, Terry Stoddard or something like that. Uh, it, the, the, the video is about the day I stopped teaching. Uh, and, uh, and, and, started, and as a teacher. Yeah. Okay. And, and you know, and, 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 and it basically was this, this kid that was going through all kinds of problems in life. And, and the teacher for, for the first time realized that it was a person. Wasn't just a person in class. Wasn't a number. Yeah, a and unit, a unit or a yeah. widget. And you're talking about these students who are saying they want to talk philosophy, and they can be the top students, they can be the bottom students. They're people, and and you can be employees who are your managers, your your frontline workers. Uh, they all have they all have this basic desire to have a purposeful life. Yep. And they have to use the talents that they've been given and the strengths they've been given. And we all have gifts. And, and I think that the whole, the, the difficulty with teaching is that we don't understand, and the system is not geared to allowing people to develop their gifts. We try to develop their weaknesses. If you, and, if you can't memorize, Bob, yeah, you, you're, not, you're not in the right system, yeah. the way it is now, the way it's set up now. Yeah. Right. So someone like me who is not trained to memorize, yeah has, uh, you know, has, has forever fought against the system, if I was back in the system, the same thing would repeat itself. Yeah. Because the system is no different today than it was 
uh, in 88 to 92 no, when I, I was at Llewellyn. It's the same changed exact the system. Yeah. And, um, you know, for, for, for us, we know we're doing the right thing because our, we don't ask the administration and we don't have parent-teacher interviews. We ask the students what they want to study. So in Toronto, I have a group of guys in the East End that I've been with for two and a half years now. They were my first group. And they choose the topics every week. And not only do they say things like, hey, Ryan, next week, can we study productivity? They don't say that. They say, can we study the philosophy of productivity, which is different than studying productivity because to study productivity means define it, memorize it, yeah. and then you'll know what it is. And then evaluate whether you've achieved we, If you have an hour conversation about productivity, I work 80 to 100 hours a week. Before that conversation that we had, I felt like a pretty productive guy. I get a lot of work done, I get a lot of meetings in, I teach a lot, I, I just do a lot. Well, at the end of that conversation, I realized I'm not productive. Reason being is, Productivity has a lot to do with the balance of your spiritual life. Whether your happiness, mm -hmm. your calmness. Yeah. You know, I'm anxiety ridden and that's why I work so much is because I can't stop. It's an addiction. Yeah. Right? So so that conversation, me being a colleague of theirs and a student in the conversation. A student of life. A student of life. And we realized, hey, none of us are productive. All for different reasons. But if we want, you know, and we all want to be more productive, but we can't, we can't, uh, we can't do it in a, in, a, in a way that it's an illusion, right? Which is really what I was doing. If I, if I do X, then I don't have to feel like I'm not productive anymore, yeah. right? If you, if you can sit at the end of the day and say this was a good day, then you've been productive. Yeah, and now I'm asking myself this question at the end of the day. Did you do your best? And did you do the right thing when you could? Yep. Right? And that, that, that helps me get over like the hours because I was just like, okay, you sent out five proposals, you sent out 15 emails, you met with Bob, you, you, you did the, the classes. Productive. Yep. Th those questions are gone and now I'm asking different questions. And did you make a difference? Did you make a difference? Absolutely. In one person's life. Then it's been a fulfilling day. And I think the productivity, fulfillment, making a difference, all those things, when you get into the, the, the workplace, they are what is dragging down productivity as we define it. As we because, define it. Because we've got this. And we define it with ways. widgets and units and, yeah. and, 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 you know, your hourly wage. And, um, you know, what we talked about in class today, actually, we were talking a bit about it. And we can transfer that now that we've defined it differently in, in a way that makes more sense to everybody. Are we using our technologies productively? Mm -hmm. Meaning Facebook. Yeah. Am I on Facebook to uh, to creep? Yeah. Am I on Facebook to, uh, to meddle say, in the drama? To, to say whether you're going to Or, or to or... look at everybody else's crappy life so I can look at mine and yeah. say, at least mine's not that bad. Yeah. Right? We can pick out all the negatives on Facebook so at the end, it's like, uh, okay, was that really productive the last two hours I spent on there? Or can I use this technology yeah. differently to yeah. make a difference in somebody's yeah. life? When somebody's yeah. calling out yeah. for yeah. help. Could you make a few good comments that would make someone feel good? And how hard is that, Bob? Yeah. That's right? Just, that's it. Like, that's it. And all you it know? takes is a and, like. And, and it might not even be a comment. Yeah, it's just it a like. Just be a like. Just which, somebody which, paid attention to what I put up there. Which means something, right? And, and yeah. again, it's something that small, like a like button on Facebook. Yeah. If, if we study it philosophically, we can understand the power of it. Yeah. That's right. like when you were going through, uh, uh, well, when you were CPG Pro. For... Uh, for you to take two minutes to stop as you're walking by a, a junior golfer and just say, hey, you know, try holding like this and then continue. It's change like pressing the, the like button, button yeah. right? That's, yeah. that's really what it is. It, it, it could change their day, yeah. right? It, yeah. it could be the same as on Facebook, the, the kid puts his grip on, on a, as a pick on Facebook, yeah. and if you like it as a CPGA pro, yeah. They're going to look at that and go, hey, the pro likes my grip. Yeah. My dad told me it was wonky. 
my friends tell me it's wonky, but this guy liked it. I like it. Yeah. I'm gonna feel more confident. Confirmation. The kid goes out and shoots the best round of his life. Just be, and we we know that that's yeah. the the most philosophical part about golf yeah. is your mind. Yeah. Thinking where they want the ball to go. Yeah, you see it before. Picture words. Right? Like, uh, I remember asking Tom Bertuzzi when he was a, a young professional hockey player about visualization. We went to high school together. We're the same age. And Todd said that he'd close his eyes the night before a game, see the television on his forehead, and watch Hockey Night in Canada. Not only watch the game, but hear the announcers, hear the crowd, the TV, everything that surrounded it, and that just pumped him up for every game, right? Every game was Hockey Night in Canada in his yeah. mind. Yeah. And, you know, it's, 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 the mind is a powerful thing, but oh, yeah. the, sure. the, the brain is not the mind. I'm sure you've we got, think it's We think it is. I'm sure you've been on the tee box and, and had a person you're playing golf with for a, a, some refreshment after the game, and they just say, oh, watch that pond. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Watch that point. Well, I might have thrown the ball in the water right now. Yeah. And, and you know what? It should be allowed because that's the type of challenges that I think are necessary in life. Yeah. You know, like, like today, um, this, this young woman who, uh, you know, I'm a reader who's not classically trained. I started to read and, and, and I found it really difficult to listen to that voice in my head. So what she said was... She's reading a poem and she's going through it and it's robotic, da, 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 da. So it's like, that's why people don't like to read, right? Who does if it's like that? And she's put, she looked at me and said, I'm a bad reader. And I looked at her and said, don't you ever say that again about yeah. yourself. First, you have to apologize to yourself for saying that. And the reason that you don't like to read is because you never learn to read. Reading is not just expressing the words on a page. Reading is doing what you and I are doing right now, yeah. right? Reading someone, reading the, we're in a studio. Yeah. We're not at Timmy's having a coffee sitting across from each other. Yeah. So reading the situation, and she's wise. She can read, yeah. right? But she has told herself she's a bad reader. What are the odds of her becoming educated through text? Slim to none, yeah, right? She's just going to figure out the system, go to college, like yeah. you said, yeah. you know, get the piece of paper, go yeah. on, and she won't be, because of that, well, hopefully today she, she changes her tune, but because of that, she'll never progress in her, uh, in her profession because progression in profession means you have to study to get there, yeah. right? Whether you're a, a PSW that becomes a nurse, if she's a PSW, she's probably not going to become a nurse because that's further education. Yeah. So it's really like, you know, what is a reader? Well, that's a, we're all readers. Yeah. I mean, I'm tall. Depends on who's beside me. Yeah, absolutely. Depends on what my comparator is. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good looking. I'm tall. <laughs> Depends who's beside yeah, me. I, I always tell people, <laughs> if I was any taller, my hat wouldn't fit. <laughs> so, so when you're looking at this whole philosophy of life, where are we going now with the Canadian Youth Golf Alliance? Because it's obvious that what you're using, you're using golf as the focal point, but it's not, it's not the end. I mean, you're, you're I, using golf to get to people. Yeah, our, 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 I'm using golf because of the attachment it has to me as well. Right. Yeah, right? Got, I, uh, I know what it did for me. That's right. And I know what it did for the, the groups of people that, right. whether you're at the Idlewild or at yeah. Timberwolf or at Lively, yeah. it's a social thing, it's a cultural thing. Yeah, you, that can, you can relate to it. And it was, was part very, of very seldom is it a bad thing, right? You get the odd uh, addict who won't go home to... You the, don't find too many people that are not happy being involved. Yeah, place. that's exactly correct. Maybe, you know, it, it's... it's uh, Even after it's, a bad game. Yeah, so, so our... our, our our slogan underneath our logo is educate, employ, engage. Right. So, so our first, uh, you know, our first mission is to help youth eliminate risks through education, not formal education. Uh, we have our own curriculum that we're developing, yeah. and whether it's stamped by the ministry or not, makes no difference to us. 
It's almost, we, it's almost uh, comic, not comic, but it's ironic that one of the risks is education. Yes, yes, it, it is, absolutely. And, and the way we educate ourselves, mm -hmm. right? It's almost, when your parents tell you when you're young just because, and you learn that, that you're not to question, yeah. that's what education until they take our course means to them. They don't question the history text, right? Even the philosophy in one of the schools that we're in right now, they, at all 10 schools when we started to develop the partnership, none of them taught philosophy, zero. So it was quite easy for us to make the argument that we were adding value. Mm -hmm. Now two of them have put it on their books. Uh, not sure if it's because of us, don't really care. Uh, actually happy that they're teaching philosophy, but they're not really teaching philosophy so much as they're teaching the history of philosophy. When Plato was born, the Greek, uh, the Greek system of politics, all of that kind of... Uh, and, it, and you know, sadly, every single one of the students in every single one of those classes is learning philosophy. Oh, they have to be. They're learning philosophy. Yeah. They're not being taught it, but they're learning it. Well, they, yeah, and they might be learning. Uh, they might be learning how to fight against it as yeah. well. Yeah. Don't deal with it. Run away. That's right. They're right? learning. They're learning you, the wrong thing. Because it, but philosophy hurts, right? Because you're asking hard questions. Oh, you ask, could you could be yeah. you could be asking hard questions about yeah. the people that you love the most, yeah. and they're hurting you, and now you realize that. It's probably perpetual, and the reason that they're hurting you is because they're in serious pain yeah. as well. Yeah. The easiest answer is because I said so. Yeah, just because, <laughs> right? Like, just because. Yeah, stop asking questions. You know, and, and, and you know, we, we don't talk about lying. Like, we, you know, what do we do in society the most that we all have in common? We're all liars. And are there any answers? Are well, the philosophy, just, of just the philosophy of lying is a great discussion in every class because... Students love realizing that the teachers are lying, right? And they might not be doing it on purpose, but if you're saying something that's untrue, that's a lie, yeah. right? And if you don't do your due diligence as an educator and find out, hey, this, this doesn't seem right, seems funny, and you still teach it, that becomes offensive, yeah. right? And, and history textbooks are the perfect example, right? We're having some some push now towards teaching uh, residential schools in our curriculum, but even they're finding that they're not teaching it. And if they are, they're brushing over it really quickly because they have to. Yeah. It's forced upon them. Yeah. So, you know, the question of, of, of the atrocity of it is, 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 yeah. is pretty plain. But, the, you know, the, the reality is, is that, you know, we have to understand why our government did it as well, right? The philosophical question about why those things happen is not always mean. No, it doesn't, know? doesn't mean that they're it has doing to happen again. The no, today that's right. Are wrong. Just let's you know? find out why we did it. Yeah. Why did it happen? That's so right. You know, like if we, if we, if we, for we always think that Canadians are nice, right? That's just what we think because we're Canadians and we like that about ourselves. Yeah. But uh, coming, moving from Sudbury to Toronto. I realized that uh, maybe I wasn't so nice to other races, right? And, and for me, it was an ignorant sort of racism. I wasn't trying to be racist, uh, but I was being racist because that's the language that I learned yeah. growing up where I grew up. And then I learned actually what racism was by asking those hard questions. Am I racist? Yeah. And so you, you, you learned, all this. You, didn't, you weren't taught. Right. But I had to ask them hard questions. You learned it from modeling. You learned it from the actions of other people. Well, you know, when you grow up with, uh, you know, when you're in the hockey uh, room with, with 15 white guys, and, uh, you know, if, if, if issues come up, even about women, you know, I, 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 the way that I, I looked at and treated women was shaped by my, myself as a teenager and not asking myself, is, is this the right way to treat women? And then the more important question, because the answer was very clear, no. And the next question would be, what is the right way to treat women as a man? 
And I didn't learn that until I was in my 30s. Because you're not allowed to ask those questions. No. Especially in school. No. Right? That's not a that's not an academic topic. That's, Jeez, that's, that's not cool. That's, yeah, it's right. not cool. That's yeah, not cool that you couldn't ask your friends because they're gonna give you the lies. Yeah. Right? That's what we're trained to do is yeah. you know, this is the way that we treat women, this is the way it's traditional. And and you know what, Bob? It's not gone anywhere. The chauvinism in, in the groups of males that I work with is still very, very clear. Absolutely. Yeah. What's um, so? What's the future for the Canadian Youth Health Lines? Obviously, you're in a growth. Yeah, we're you're in, you're in a development. Right now, stage. right now we we've expanded to, um, to to groups in in the GTA in Toronto in Newmarket. We're working with three or four groups, and in Sudbury, we're working with four groups. So our plan is the next two years to expand within those regions, to not create new regions. So there's more high schools in Sudbury that we, we can go work with. And then same thing in Newmarket, there's four or five more schools we can work with. In the GTA, there's obviously, you know, hundreds of schools. And then what we want to do after we've expanded a little bit within those regions is to start expand across the, the, the whole country. So, so this is really, uh, like it's critical to have the right people in front of the group. So your expansion really depends on people that you put in the classroom yeah you can't be there all the time no so how are how do you anticipate the growth <coughs> uh, kind of like each I'm looking I'm looking for so I'm looking for I, I found someone uh, here um, but it's going to be a process to see if the youth trust them okay. right so so this person is a philosopher and has suffered from some serious risks in their lives and is open about talking about them. Uh, the, the person can't come from within the system. That's the first thing. This, this, the students, even when there's a teacher in the room, uh, are a lot different than when that teacher exits the room. And thankfully, most of the teachers get that when the students are holding back and, it, you know, I should leave so that whatever student it is can open up and, and you know. Yeah, you have to have a lot of confidence as a teacher to leave the room when someone else is in there too because absolutely you have to have, somebody has to be, that is certified has to be. Yeah, ab absolutely. So so that's the trust that has to happen, yeah. not, not only amongst the students, but amongst the staff that, so yeah. so it, it's, it's a process. It took me over a year to get there, oh, I but, but now I'm there with all my schools and mainly it's not it's 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 not the teacher, it's the students yeah. that have uh, told the teacher without telling them with words. We want to be alone with Ryan, and the reason is is because we can't say the same things, and we don't want to. It's it's not a lecture, and when the teacher's there, it becomes a lecture for me, because I study. I take my job very seriously in all aspects. So when I go to a class. Um, you want to be able to come back. Well, I, yeah, and I, I, I want to be able to come back, but I also want the students to, to, to know that I've done my homework, yeah. right? To study, and, and whether we're talking about productivity, you know, I studied because it was a group of Muslim guys that I was working with, I studied stuff from the Quran and what the Prophet Muhammad had to say about productivity, right? So then they go, oh, hey, how is this guy know more than us? about what's coming out of the Quran on productivity, right? Because the way they're trained to interpret the Quran, or sorry, wrong word, to study the Quran is through memorization. To memorize prayers and to, and to repeat those prayers. But the interpretation is kind of like a little bit of the old school Catholic system where, you know, you, you go into the church and the, the Bible's not in the pew for a reason. It's not up to you as the parishioner to to interpret right it's up to so so we sing psalms or whatever we do in church and and when we go home that stays there right at least in my family when till I was 16 and was able to make up my own decision about whether that was something I wanted to continue doing yeah. and like most 16 year old boys <laughs> I exited the church as quickly as I possibly could mainly because it's 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 not a philosophical place. But it had a, a profound effect on who you are today. Absolutely. Because I, you were able to experience that. 
Absolutely. And you're not experienced that, you may not be where you are today. Yeah, no, I, 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 I probably wouldn't be where I am because it gave me my, it gave me my first battle of with authority yeah. against that authority, and then the person it gave me my empathetic person I am today. Yeah. I realize why the church exists. The the questions I ask about the church are now not so much, uh, you know, as an academic trying to criticize it, yeah. more as a person trying to understand it. Why is it why is it the way it is? Yeah. And then you get a new pope who is purely philosophical, the new pope, asking those hard questions. Yeah. Or, or saying like, who am I to judge? That's right. right? That is that is deep. Yeah. From, right? From a pope. And, and that is the way that, can you imagine if teachers thought that? Yeah. Who am I to judge the student on how yeah. smart they are? Yeah. And yet, teachers themselves are being judged so much. Well, just, just think of a true or false question. Right. So you got a, you got a question, is it true or false? If someone says false, and the answer in your book or your, is true, you don't ask them why. Right? They might have a great reason why it's yeah. false. Yeah. Mainly because they don't believe the BS that's coming from the book. Yeah, no. Right? Yeah, there has to be a, let me explain. Yeah. It's false because, but, you know what, people, I've, thought, I've thought about it. Yeah, the people who put let me explain are going to be good lawyers. And, and um, maybe maybe it's due to, to an amount of work that would come with it too, Bob, because if you're a teacher and you have to oh. now... You Inter don't, interpret the, the. You don't this, want to mark essays. Yeah, you don't want to mark essays, and, <laughs> and in my world, that's all I did when I was a prof at Humber. Uh, my my educational method was explanation, right? The, there was no grades on uh, right or wrong. And people say that all the time, but I truly was. Yeah. Uh, I, I truly saw whether you studied or not. Right, and that's what it was. Like, yeah. explain your answer. If you think, sure. if you want to criticize the system of education, just because, yeah. that's not going to fly. Yeah. Right. I, I used to always say, convince me. Right. If, you, if we have differing opinions, you convince me that you're right. And and, and, and I will be open enough to accept your argument. Your argument is good. I'll I might not still agree with it, but I'll accept it. Give me an argument. Yeah, and that's that's you know. Debate. Yeah. I don't know. They have debating clubs. Who goes to the debating club? Uh, generally, every time. Not the not the students who are in, in applied. Generally, every time somebody was trying to explain why they didn't do their homework, we were involved in the debate. In a debate club. <laughs> but I mean the debate clubs at I high know. schools. I know. It's, but it's it's hard to teach debating. Because you're not debaters. That's right. The How can you teachers, teach something that you're not good at? Teachers are have become very good at regurgitating. Yeah, yeah how about there. bring in the history text and let the people who are, uh, you know, teaching the history text, let's say just in the board in Sudbury. It's a great example. you got the public board. Uh, what is there, 14 schools? Oh, Something like that in the high schools? Six, high schools? High schools. Uh, there's about eight or nine. Okay, so, eight, so let's say there's eight schools. Let's get eight grade 10 history teachers in here debating the, the topics that are in the text. They won't know how to. No. no. They really won't. No, because, <laughs> and, and again, the nature of the career is that you're the authority. Well, they're not meant to, to go study other texts either. No, no. and, right? and you they're, are the authority. There's, you are, absolute there's authority. There's debating. Yeah. Why, 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 why is this? Just because. Yeah, just because. Control. Which has got to be frustrating for new teachers who are really eager to, oh, it is. to, yeah. to, to make that difference in this, in open, yeah. open some minds, as they say, right? And I think when you're getting into any career, uh, there's that uh, reality check when you walk in on that first day in the job and you find out that, wow, this isn't what I anticipated because all of the people are enlightening me on what my role is truly going to be. And you grew up in the suburb area, uh, working for INCO. Uh, summer students were very quickly pulled to the side and told, you follow me, don't yeah. you go ahead and, and make me look bad by working yeah. twice as hard just because yeah. you're here for the summer. You know, we're, this we're, system, we're this career people. You, you sit beside me and I'll tell you when to work. And, and, and you got into that. So I mean, we, what, a, what a wonderful program you got. I, I, I'm, well, we've, got to, we've got to do this again. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because we could talk philosophy. It'd be nice if later on we get some of the, the older kids that might want to come in and. Uh, absolutely, I could get a couple part. come in and, and take part in it yeah. because they. Some of the what what they're students. learning is is that through philosophy, um, what their duty is as a human being. Yeah. Right, and, and it's to give back, just like you are. And I don't think it's a matter of crashing the system or being. I think it's a matter of evaluating or examining the system and asking questions. It doesn't mean that you're you're saying that what people are doing is wrong. It's, no, it's, absolutely not. It's right for the right people, but it's not right for everybody. And but we're we're kind of pigeonholing people and, and creating <laughs> stress. And, and again, it means something, right, Bob? It's yeah. it's, it's the same as questioning why we created residential schools or not that's not to bash the people who lived in that day it's to understand it so if we ask why are we educating people this way today it's not to bash it's to understand it and once yeah. we understand it maybe then maybe then we can make some change yeah. but until we understand what it even means Right. Yeah. It, to me, it means that we're, we, we love science and math, and we think that if you study it, you're going to get a great job, and you're going to be an engineer at Inco or whatever, or you're going to be engineering a radio station. Yeah. But as far as studying humanities, people think I'm nuts. And maybe I am, but uh, I'd rather be nuts in thinking than an unthinking not nut. There's a philosophical yeah. way to end this. There's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so um, much, Bob. Hey, it's been great, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, Canadian Youth Golf Alliance. Uh, th this radio show, if anybody tuned in late, is, is going to be, like, it's been videotaped, so it's going to be posted on thelearningclinic.ca. And and uh, if you want to link to it off of. Uh, we'll put it on our website and Facebook and all that stuff for sure. Because I think there's segments in here that, that, that could be very very much appropriate for discussion sessions on philosophy because it's a uh, it, it's it's life and we talked about things that matter we talked about things that matter isn't that a good way of feeling like you've done something today so we can go to bed feeling good bob yeah good work great thanks so much okay thanks a lot for coming in uh ryan cooney the canadian youth golf alliance executive director and you've been listening to the learning clinic on cklu 96.7 fm i'm your host bob Kerr. On, 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 on Sunday, May 25th, you are invited to participate in the first Sudbury Defeat Depression 2 and 5 kilometer walk and run. This event